Our guest of honor is uh, Professor Rizwan Hamid Malik. Uh, he'll be arriving soon. He has recently retired as uh, um, head of department, orthopedic surgery, PIMS, after serving for almost 30 years. And uh, we were uh, targeting uh, 20 to 30 uh, participants, but uh, the response has been overwhelming, and we expect much more than that. And uh, I request uh, from the participants that uh, this is a golden opportunity. Uh, please take maximum advantage, be interactive, ask questions, and try to learn things. And uh, organizing such events is uh, always requires hard work. We have tried our best, but uh, I apologize in advance in case there are some shortcomings. So I wish you a great learning experience. Thank you so much. I'd like to invite Dr. Sikandar Hayat, Professor Dr. Sikandar Hayat, who is course chairman and head of department, Pediatric Orthopedics Department, Khyber Medical University, Peshawar. Rahim. Uh, I am really thankful to Dr. Ali Shami for organizing this course and taking the time to, to organize this. The idea of conducting this course in Islamabad was that we did the first course a few years ago in Lahore. Then we, I think, did two courses of pediatric trauma in uh, Peshawar. And then the last course was done in uh, uh, Karachi under the supervision of uh, <coughs> Professor Bhatti Saab. So I think Islamabad was the area where we didn't did the course actually, and we wanted to have a, have a course over here. The idea of this course was floated by Professor David Spiegel a few years ago with me. He came with the idea, and he actually wanted to conduct a, a survey before the course uh, so that uh, we know uh, what should be the content of this course and what should be the, uh, uh, the format of this course. So this was actually the background that many short-term educational courses given throughout the world, but with the limited information is available and the impact in the term of the knowledge and skill acquired or change in the practice. So we wanted to have a actually uh, objective analysis of whether we need, uh, what should be the content of this course and whether this course should have any impact in the practice or the practice can be changed. So this was actually the goal to develop a conceptually relevant pediatric trauma course which suits the need of the general orthopedic surgeon in Pakistan. So our aim was to, to target the general orthopedic surgeon, not the pediatric orthopedic surgeon because they are still very few in Pakistan. And when I was the vice president of the Pakistan Orthopedic Association in 2017, so actually we named this course as a POA pediatric trauma course. And I presented this idea over there in the board. And the board actually uh, passed this idea to go ahead with the, with the course. So the other objective was to prove that it has an impact in the knowledge gained and the skill acquired. So when David came with this idea in the phase one, so he came up with a the, with the, with the questionnaire along with them. And he, he showed to me the questionnaire that this is actually the questionnaire. We want to float this questionnaire uh, in a soft format throughout the, uh, pediat uh, sorry, the orthopedic community of the Pakistan. And this questionnaire was developed by Divya, who is actually working over there in USA with him uh, as an educational expert. So the, the, the idea was to disseminate this need assessment survey through email and we can take interviews with the key uh, stakeholder as well. And when we get back the, 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 the uh, e email responses, then we have to construct what are the areas to be targeted. So this was the phase two actually. And in the phase four, development and testing of the pre-test and post-test survey, we haven't done this so far actually. We are planning to do it, but because of the, because of the COVID in between for two years, we were unable to do this, this uh, third stage of the course. So in the pre-testing, what was actually the idea that what are the current level of the knowledge and skill of the people? What resources are available to address those pathologies, especially pediatric trauma in children? And how respondents like to learn? What, what are their, their way to be learned actually? Uh, Open-ended question to determine what knowledge and skill they would like to acquire. 
सो दिस वॉज एक्चुअली द सर्वे इस तरह वो डिवेलप किया गया था शुरू में जिसमें ओपन फ्रैक्चर के बारे में भी क्वेश्चन थे सॉफ्ट टिश्यू कवरेज के कंपॉर्टेंट सिंड्रोम इनिशियली वी पुट दिस क्वेश्चन ऑन द ऑन द स्पाइन एज वेल एंड इन द इनिशियल टू कोर्सेज द स्पाइन ट्रामा वॉज इंक्लूडेड इन द कोर्स बट लेटर ऑन वी केम टू नो दैट दिस पार्ट ऑफ द कोर्स आई थिंक इट शुड एंड बी इंक्लूडेड बिकॉज देयर आर नंबर वन इट वॉज द नंबर ऑफ द पेशेंट वर टू लिमिटेड and there were spine surgeon who were actually dealing with the spine trauma so that's why from the pediatric trauma course we excluded the spine then then there was question about the upper extremity lower extremity um, uh, resource available whether they have got resources of the imn flexible nailing external fixator so uh, the the the, uh, the 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 respondent has to answer about these questions about the actually the, the way they want to learn what type of learning they would like to have they would like to have a lecture interactive lectures uh, uh, hands on or something like that and how many days we, we would like to have this course so initially i think it was about uh, two and a half days but then later on we we uh, shrink it to one and a half day so now we are we are actually conducting this course in one and a half day mention that we haven't done so far so hard copies were also distributed among the respondent in uh, uh, in arthocons and link was sent to the poi member officially and personal contact was made uh, for the, with the people to to fill this service we were expecting actually at that time the initial survey that we may have a, at least 150 to 200 uh, responses out of the 1500 officially at that time it was about 200 official member of poa so we were expected that at least 200 people will will respond but you will see how many people have responded you can see bar bar us karne ke baad bhi ye 58 60 70 logon ne response kiya tha aur ye uska jo outcome tha ke wo kaise usko dekh rahe hain matlab open fracture ka aap dekh le to कन्फिडेंस uh, लेवल जो है वो कितना है ज़्यादा है कम है आप सॉफ्ट टिश्यू कवरेज के बारे में देख लें ठीक है मोस्ट ऑफ द पीपल वर अबाउट एवरेज नॉलेज एंड एवरेज स्किल टू ट्रीट द सॉफ्ट टिश्यू कवरेज कंपार्टमेंट सिंड्रोम के बारे में मोस्ट ऑफ द पीपल वर कॉन्फिडेंट दिस इज अबाउट द प्रोक्सिमल फीमर फीमोरल शेफ्ट एंड डायफिजल फ्रैक्चर सो दिस वॉज एक्चुअली द आउटकम ऑफ दोस्त सर्वे जो अट्ठावन लोगों ने हमें रिस्पॉन्स किया था तो प्रोक्सिमल फीमर के बारे में वो कैसे ट्रीट करते हैं दे आर कॉन्फिडेंट फीमर और शेफ के बारे में तो सारे लोग कह रहे थे कि भाई हम बहुत ज़्यादा कॉन्फिडेंट हैं लेकिन अगर आप देख लें तो हम सारे लोग अभी भी मेजॉरिटी लोग के नेल ही कर रहे हैं ओपन के नेल कर रहे हैं सो दे थिंक दैट दिस इज़ द बेस्ट वे टू ट्रीट द ओपन शेफ फ्रैक्चर जो हमारे ख्याल में नहीं है ओपन फ्रैक्चर के बारे में सो दिस आज जितने भी क्वेश्चन थे वो सारा हमने फिर उसको टेबुलेट किया वो दिव्या जो थी लेवी डेविड के साथ हमने सारे रिस्पॉन्सेज उसको भिजवाए उसने इसको फिर वो प्रॉपरली इवेल्यूएट किया और ये उसके तरफ से जो हमें रिस्पॉन्स मिला था यही था क्यूरिकुलम के कंसल्टेशन के बारे में एक्सटर्नल फिक्सेटर फ्लेक्सीबल मेडिकल ये था कि केस बेस्ड डिस्कशन में मोस्ट ऑफ द पीपल वॉन्टेड टू हैव केस बेस्ड डिस्कशन और इसके लिए हमारा ये ख्याल था कि जब हम ये कोर्स शुरू करेंगे तो वक्त के साथ साथ हमने फैकल्टी को ये कहा था कि वो केसेस कलेक्ट करना शुरू करें अपने केसेस कलेक्ट करें जो अच्छे भी हैं जो बुरे भी हैं जिसमें कम्प्लिकेशन है सो देट अगर हम कोई चीज़ पढ़ा रहे हैं तो वो केस बेस हो ठीक है ये एरिया भी अभी तक हमारा थोड़ा बहुत डिफिशेंट है कि उसमें उसी तरह केस बेस्ड डिस्कशन लेक्चर डिवेलप नहीं हुए और हम चाहते हैं कि ये उसके साथ हो तो वी विल रिक्वेस्ट द फैकल्टी डेट दे शुड स्टार्ट कलेक्टिंग द केसेज देयर ओन केसेज और उनको फिर उस लेक्चर्स में इनकारपोरेट करते रहें लाइक सपोज अगर हम कोई कम्प्लिकेशन उनको पढ़ा रहे हैं तो उसका अगर कोई केस होगा वो पढ़ाएंगे तो उससे मेरे ख्याल में वो जो है लेक्चर ज़्यादा इंटरेक्टिव बनेगा सो ये उसके दिन के बारे में था मोस्ट ऑफ द पीपल वॉन्टेड टू है नट मोर देन टू डेज अच्छा we were thankful to the to david that he was kind enough that he even arrange a grant of initial grant of about 1000 uh, us dollar from posna for this course and that uh, grant is still pending and he he, he emailed me uh, a few weeks ago that if you don't utilize this grant so it may lapse so
so we are trying to utilize this grant as well in this course so that we can we can claim for the further uh, grants so this is actually the plan so hum ye utilize karenge to phir aage jayenge na agar ye utilize ye wapas lapse ho jaye so 1000 dollar to phir to kuch bhi nahi kar sakte so in summary i can say it is designed to suit the need of poa membership ye actually basic wo tha aur lekin अनफॉर्चुनेटली पी ओ ए की तरफ से फिर हमें वो सपोर्ट नहीं मिली कि हम इसको आगे लेके जाते हैं तो हम इसको खुद ही लेके जा रहे हैं पर्सनल एफर्ट्स पे मत हम उसको पीडियाटिक आर्टिफिक सोसाइटी ऑफ पाकिस्तान के फोरम से इस कोर्स को हम अभी चला रहे हैं पी ओ ए की तरफ से हमें वो सपोर्ट नहीं मिली इस कोर्स के लिए वो इंथ्यूजम नहीं मिला जिस तरह हम चाहते थे रिसर्च कम्पोनेंट विल बी डिटर्मेंट इम्पेक्ट ऑफ द एजुकेशन प्रोग्राम ठीक है इनफॉर्म इनफॉर्म फर्दर डिवेलपमेंट एंड फोस्टर कोलेबोरेशन बिटवीन द प्रोफेशनल सोसाइटी लेकिन ये हमारा मकसद था कि वी वॉन्ट टू डिवेलप अ कोलेबोरेशन बिटवीन द पाकिस्तान आर्थोपेडिक एसोसिएशन आर पीडियाटिक आर्थोपेडिक सोसाइटी ऑफ पाकिस्तान एंड पोस्ना सो होपफुली वी मे बी एबल टू अचीव समथिंग फ्राम दिस ये टू थाउजेंड सेवनटीन का जो हमारा था जो हमने पहला सर्वे किया था तो ये हमारा जो उसमें कॉन्फ्रेंस थी पेशावर में मशहूर कॉन्फ्रेंस जिसमें इलेक्शन हुआ था नसीर साहब है मंजूर साहब अल्लाह बख्शे वो ही ही एक्सपायर्ड वन एंड हाफ ईयर एगो डेविड था इट वाज रिचर्ड आई थिंक रिचर्ड ही केम टू अवर अवर कॉन्फ्रेंस ही ही हैड अ वेरी गुड लेक्चर ऑन द ऑन द दिस मस्कुलर टेक्निक स्टेट ऑफ आर्ट लेक्चर था इसका दिस इज डॉक्टर वांग चाओ ही वाज इनिशियली माय मेंटर एंड नाउ ही इज द मेंटर ऑफ द सईद एज वेल सो थैंक यू सो मच Invite uh, Dr. Saeed Jadoon uh, to guide us on the principles of pearls and pitfalls in pediatric fractures. Uh, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. I am uh, Saeed Ahmed. I am Saeed Ahmed, and I am working as a assistant professor of pediatric orthopedic in Prime Teaching Hospital, Peshawar. This is my alma mater. I did my training from Gurki Trust Teaching Hospital, Lahore. and i did my pediatric orthopedic fellowship uh, from hong kong and also spent some time in in cell burn and seattle children hospital so our children small adults my question from the residents any idea how they are different uh one of my colleague uh, son has got this fracture and he sent to one of the resident and uh this was a very uh, unique reply there is no tibio fibular overlap seems like there is syndesmotic injury along with distal tibia fracture refer to peds for stress test and examination to rule out syndesmotic injury if it if it's there need syndesmotic screw fixation at least uh, i don't have any idea that anybody do a stress test for the syndesmotic injury in pediatric population so So now coming to statistics uh, trauma is the leading cause of death and pediatric fractures account for 15% of all injuries boy injured more than the girls and injury increases with advancing age radius and ulna it's the most common fracture followed by supracondylar fracture and at least in pakistan what i see femur is also a very common fracture although in this chart it shows at a very down level but very common fracture in pakistan children are not small adults they have they are different from adults uh, and this difference diminishes with age uh, some children they are prone to injuries like fracture uh, uh, usually fracture increases with advancing age so adolescent are more prone to injuries than the young children low bone mineral content like in osteogenesis imperfecta and other some underlying pathologies like simple bone cysts they are more prone to develop fractures neuromuscular disorders like non walker cps and myelomeningocele they are prone to develop fractures and some children have got fracture personality like hyperactive child those children who are involved in contact sports so five is this is a unique structure in children the children have the ability to grow their bones and in infants the fibers are very strong so you, most of the time the bone actually fracture at the diaphyseal region so this was a birth trauma case in which there is a uh, fracture of the shaft of the femur with the increasing age the physis gets weaker adolescent physis fracture uh, so the adolescent get physal fractures are common in adolescent age 
Physis helps in remodeling, so, uh, but provided that no bone block is formed at the physis, if bone block formed, then LLD angular deformity at some type both can occur. Like this is a uh, seven year old boy who has a history of trauma to the distal uh, femur and develop a bone block on the lateral aspect. So he is developing a genovelgum on the right side. Uh, children has got thick joint cartilage and this joint cartilage we cannot usually see on x-ray or image intensifier. So we need a technique that is called orthography in which we inject a dye inside the joint so that the cartilage is outlined for us. So this was a case, a one year old child uh, referred to me uh, as a suspected case of elbow dislocation. Dislocations are very uncommon in infants and in young children. So uh, I did an orthography for him. So this was a transphysal separation of the distal uh, humerus. So on orthography, you can see this is the uh, cartilaginous distal, uh, the, uh, distal part of the humerus. So it's like a supracondylar fracture. After orthography, we reduce it, close and pass these two uh, k wires. So Children has got uh, thick periosteum and this thick periosteum uh, thickness decreases with the age. So this thick periosteum it helps in close reduction of the fracture and also help in rapid healing. Like this is a supracondylar fracture uh, with posterior medial uh, uh, displacement. So this part of the periosteum is intact. So we would utilize this part of the periosteum to reduce the, uh, the fracture. So applying, so applying a traction and uh, reducing the fracture in flexion and pronation. So this thick periosteum, it helps, it help us to reduce this fracture. So this fracture was closely reduced and uh, close percutaneous spinning were done. Children has got more collagen and because of that, they have more elasticity and plasticity and generally they require more force to break their bones. <coughs> and plastic deformation is more common and this can especially very important in ulna when there is a plastic deformation of the ulna so always suspect for the radial head uh, dislocation. So it was a missed Montegia fracture. Green stick fracture is also same mechanism because of the more elasticity and plasticity green stick fractures are common in children. Children has got a very peculiar blood supply and we must take care of it especially the two regions are very important. It's the, the uh, femoral head and the radial head. Like this, a K nail was passed elsewhere and through the piriform uh, fossa and uh, the blood supply of the femoral head was damaged. And later on, it, it ended up into a severe type of the avascular necrosis at the age of 14 years. So as Dr. Sikandar already mentioned, it's not a and uh, it's not a good implant, it, it always leads to, uh, not always, but most of the time it leads to avascular necrosis. Of Children has got a very uh, good remodeling potential and we must utilize it. Uh, this was a segmental fracture. I took this slide from the Global Health. It's available on the Global Health website. It was a segmental fracture which was managed in a hip spica cast and complete remodeling occurred in one year time. So we must keep in mind the, the principle of remodeling. Uh, Professor David uh, will, will give a talk on remodeling. This uh, sometimes, like this is a distal radius fracture, very benign fracture could have been easily managed in cast. Somebody pin it and it developed pin track infection leading into osteomyelitis of the distal radius and ulna. So very deformed uh, ulna. So we must uh, uh, think before uh, operating on the children. Evulsion fracture, in adolescent age, the ligaments are stronger and the bones get weaker. So evulsion fractures are common. The, this was a uh, case referred to me, uh, somebody yesterday with a pain in the uh, greater trochanter re region. So there was a evulsion fracture over here. These are my references, thank you. Any question? Uh, question? Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, has everyone received the pre-course surveys? 
kindly fill it out. Uh, our Honorable Dr. David Spiegel is conducting a pre-course survey. Uh, on that note, I would like to invite you, sir, to guide, on, guide us on the principles of healing and remodeling of pediatric fractures. I mean, I have to say, now that I come to participate, of course, I hope that what I present will be useful. But for me, it's really a holiday because I get to spend time with friends that I really like and I hope to see more often. So I'm from Philadelphia. It's the birthplace in some ways of our country, but it's one of the five biggest cities. And I work at a pure children's hospital in a university setting. However, this is a bit of a second home to me, um, having been here almost 20 times now. So it's I, funny that I could have walked over here. My wife uh, grew up here, and her parents lived two blocks on the other side of the Centaurus Mall. And so there's the house, and that's my daughter, Sophie, who's now much older. But anyhow, so it's a real thrill for me to be able to participate in a workshop so close to my second home. I always recognize Professor Oweas, a friend for more than 20 years now, as well as many other people. Some have been left out here because I don't have enough pictures. So thanks to all of you. So my topic for the first lecture is healing and remodeling. There are a few take home messages from this. We consider in children's orthopedics growth to be the fourth dimension. Okay, it's both a blessing and a curse because we need to make decisions about being less aggressive than in adult orthopedics because we recognize that there's a lot of potential for remodeling of the children's fractures. We also have the opportunity to, be, to do minimally invasive treatment strategies in children versus adults. However, one consequence of children's fractures, particularly involving the growth mechanism, is that damage to the growth mechanism can cause a deformity. So that's a whole other dimension of the treatment. And so it's very important to know remodeling potential in pediatric fractures. Younger patients have a lot more growth remaining, more options for remodeling. The location of the fracture, in the metaphysis or in the physis, greater potential. Plane of joint motion, for example, in the wrist, in flexion and extension, elbow, flexion and extension. Fractures that are in the, in the plane of the joint motion have a greater potential to remodel. And finally, educate the families. We can leave a lot of x-rays that don't look so good to families if we educate them and convince them that this will be OK and that the outcome will be adequate. We don't need to operate. So this is part of the pediatric orthopedics is discussion and education with family. So as far as the healing process goes, we'll do a brief review of that. There are four phases to bone healing. And it's not unique to children, same as adults. In the first phase, you've had a trauma. And the initial response is that of inflammation. There's a hematoma. Uh, inflammatory cells go to the hematoma. The hematoma gets walled off. And so you've got this mass of uh, congealed blood and hematoma. Cellular things are going on in that. And then as the process goes on, there's uh, capillaries or there's vascularization of that hematoma. So in the second stage, basically you're forming a, it's kind of like a toothpaste holding the bones together. A cartilage template over which bone is made. So the main cells are chondrocytes and fibroblasts with growth factors. There's no vascularity at this point, but this model that's becoming more solid gets invaded by blood vessels, which then leads to the third phase, or hard callus, or primary bone formation. So the blood supply comes in, and now the osteoblasts are there participating in a process in which the soft callus is removed, and irregular wo woven bone, or hard callus, is placed. And the last phase is that of the remodeling, when this hard callus converts to cortical bone or trabecular bone and then becomes remodeled. Remodeling is the job of the osteoclasts. So they're taking down 
the old bone and then the osteoblasts are laying down new bone over those places. So as we go through the days today, uh, looking at all the different fractures, just a general review, the green stick fracture is a fracture unique to children. There's uh, uh, asymmetric uh, failure of the bone, so there's a tension side where the bone splits apart and a compression side where the bone bends. These are unique to children, as is plastic deformation, in which the bone has bent but not completely broken. And then there are the variety of the complete fractures. And I'm just briefly reviewing these. You'll see these themes throughout the two-day course. But, you know, you've got the uh, twisting or spiral type in which the mechanism of injury is torsion and there's an intact periosteal hinge. Um, the transverse fractures in which the, hinge in, the periosteal hinge stays intact on one side of the bone. The oblique in which there's uh, an axial loading and this is unstable and then the butterfly which of course is unstable. So this type of concept for the complete fractures helps the surgeon to understand how to reverse the mechanism of injury and reduce the fracture but it also predicts for complete fractures which will be unstable. So these aren't exactly these two slides in line with the topic of my presentation, but I'm just introducing these concepts as you'll see they come back through the two days. So again, pediatric fractures growth is the fourth dimension. We spoke again. Younger patients with more than two years of growth left have more of an excellent remodeling potential. Once again, to reinforce, fractures of the metaphysis and the physis have greater remodeling potential. Plane of motion of the joint, and then translation is better for remodeling than um, rotation, for example. And the, the issue of growth disturbance in children's fractures can ultimately lead to limb length inequality, which is particularly more of an issue with the lower extremities, can lead to progressive angular deformities, and can also lead to growth stimulation or overgrowth. So these concepts will be important as we go through the different types of fractures over the next two days. So how about remodeling? Most of the remodeling occurs at the level of the physis. So even if the fracture is here, most of the remodeling will occur at the growth plate. So that's why longer, greater time, greater growth remaining leads to greater remodeling. One quarter of remodeling occurs here at the level of fracture due to asymmetric growth or, and the periosteum is involved. So the physial remodeling occurs along the lines of stresses and so there'll be asymmetric growth which will occur to result in straightening of the bone as you see here. When it comes to the, uh, I'm sorry, not the physial remodeling but the periosteal remodeling, now we're talking about uh, periosteal new bone formation, which is more pronounced on the compression side rather than on the tension side. And so there's resorption of bone here, laying down of new bone here, and gradual straightening of the bone. So back to the example which I showed you uh, before. Here's two weeks. You can see uh, some periosteal new bone formation. And then as time moves forward by two years, you can see uh, remodeling um, is more extensive and this will continue. Again, 75% of the remodeling occurring at the growth plate, but also here at the site of the fracture. So here's an example in a child who's got lots of remodeling, a baby with a fracture of the humerus. You can see the new bone formation concentrated on the compression side, not on the tension side. And as time goes, this completely straightens out. So as you well know, fractures in, in the babies and in the infants have extensive remodeling potential. Okay, so here's an example of a proximal humeral fracture. I don't know the age of the patient, but you can see 100% translation and some shortening. Um, there's no new bone over here. All of the new bone is new periosteal bone here. Then as time goes, remodeling goes, you can see how it looks a year after the injury. So this is an extensive capacity for remodeling. Another case, young child, proximal humerus, 
The answer is do a sling and counsel the family. And, and rightfully, they're very worried about the way the x-ray looks, but we have to caution them that aggressive treatment is not warranted in the young children with this type of a fracture. Here's another case, obviously treated with surgical management, in this case an external fixation, but the point being that translation here can completely remodel over time. And so even when we're doing surgical treatment of fracture in children, it doesn't have to be perfect to the extent that we might require in adults. So even when we do our uh, surgical treatment, we can do minimally invasive surgery and allow for remodeling to finish the job. So here are some additional cases just to illustrate the remodeling potential in the pediatric age group. Here's a 14-year-old, a couple of years of growth left. You can see the fracture healed, malaligned, and later on remodeled. Here's a patient. These, by the way, and I'll give him credit, are personally given to me by Kay Wilkins, who many of you know from Rockwood and Wilkins' uh, fracture text in children. Um, here's another example of extensive remodeling over a 15-month period, even in an older patient. Here's a patient who came in 10 days injury. It fracture involves the growth plate. If you manipulate a growth plate fracture more than five to seven days after injury, you're likely to cause damage to the growth mechanism. So in younger children, it's more practical to leave this alone and let there be remodeling rather than to reduce the fracture, get it right, and then cause a growth disturbance, which then needs to be treated later. So these are the balances of judgment and, and the decision-making in children's fractures. So in this case, the doctor elected just to cast and not to reduce, and down the road there was extensive remodeling. Bayonet apposition, fractures side by side as shown here, very appropriate typically in children less than 10 years of age, and you can see the remodeling at 18 months. So on our side, when we're giving these lectures to the general orthopedic crowd, our focus is in trying to have them understand that you don't need to do an open reduction in plate fixation in a young child with this type of a fracture because remodeling can be extensive. And here's yet another example. Here again out of Kay Wilkins. Now, we tend to, I have to be honest with you, in our uh, society where everything is expected to be perfect, we typically don't watch a fracture like this with a diaphyseal malalignment remodel. Even though it's possible and we may be able to have a, satis a satisfactory outcome, our cultural, I guess you'd say, or our typical practice patterns are a bit more aggressive with diaphyseal fractures even in younger children. But I show these slides because they're of very importance because, you know, Kay Wilkins has used these for years. And whether or not we choose to accept this in our treatment, we recognize that remodeling is possible. Now, even for supracondylar humerus fractures, uh, angulation does not remodel at all. So if there's varus, there will always be varus. However, uh, translation does remodel. And so uh, this is a dramatic example of that. And to a certain extent, some degree of sagittal plane remodeling can occur in supracondylar humerus fractures. And I think this will be appropriate for our consideration in late presenting cases, obviously, whether to go and do an osteotomy early or not. And I talk about this briefly in the supracondylar lecture. So again, once patients are getting uh, closer to skeletal maturity, this did fine, however, in a 14-year-old with this degree of malalignment, there's insufficient uh, remodeling. And so if the fracture heals with a lot of varus and there's not remodeling, you might have to go back later and do an osteotomy. Rotation does not remodel. And so the last couple of slides, um, these talks will all be made available to you as a PDF for anyone who's welcome after the course. But um, again, this is a great paper from Kay Wilkins on remodeling potential. And even though there are only guidelines suggested, uh, you can see here what some of these guidelines are for the radial shaft, the hand, and so on. 
And so you can take a picture of that. I can send you the PDF of the article. But the article is freely available for download on the internet. Kay Wilkins. Lastly, Dr. Hayat will speak about growth plate, dis, uh, growth plate problems. So I'll just quickly leave you with, as the course goes on, growth disturbance without adequate follow-up and treatment can result in some very challenging clinical situations. And so um, even f difficult fractures treated appropriately can still go on to have complications, and we'll discuss some of that. So again, the take-home messages, I don't want to go over time. Growth is the fourth dimension. Remodeling, particularly in younger patients around the physis and metaphysis, in the play and emotion of the joint, can be extensive, as well as translation. And growth disturbance can lead to a host of problems. So as the next day and a half goes forward, we'll explore some of these concepts. Here is the article. It's available freely online. And I'll thank Kay Wilkins for giving me access to many of his cases, which I've shown you. And thanks. Can't wait to have some of these. Thank you. <laughs>